Welcome to Spilling the Tea with Dr. Joyce, a podcast that goes deeper than the highlight reel on social media. I'm Dr. Joyce Park, a board certified dermatologist, content creator at Tea with MD, and founder of Skin Refinery Dermatology Clinic. Each week, I will be joined here by a remarkable guest, and together we'll discuss stories and strategies for balancing our challenging careers with our personal relationships while making time for beauty routines and self care. So grab your favorite cup of tea, get comfy, and let's get ready to spill the tea together. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Spilling the Tea with Dr. Joyce, where we talk about the things that we often don't share on social media. Today's guest is Dr. Laura Shaheen, whom I'm so excited to have on because she is an amazing physician, content creator, educator, and also was my doctor (laughs) and helped me walk through my own very challenging journey with infertility. So Dr. Shaheen, welcome. And I'm going to start off with just reading a brief bio and then we'll dive in. Does that sound okay? Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited to be here, Joyce. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks for making the time. So Dr. Laura Shaheen is a double board certified physician. She's double board certified in reproductive endocrinology and infertility and obstetrics and gynecology. She graduated from Georgetown University and completed medical school at Wake Forest University, did her OBGYN residency at UCSF, and her reproductive endocrinology and infertility fellowship at Stanford. Go trees! (laughs) Dr. Shaheen is a physician of many talents. In addition to helping complete families for her patients, she's an accomplished author, educator, and content creator with over 500,000 followers on multiple social media platforms around the world. She's also the host of the podcast, Very Popular podcast, Baby or Bust. And this has inspired me personally to start my own podcast. Mm. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Shaheen. We are so excited to hear about your career, your journey, and how the heck you make everything work. (laughs) Thank you. I'll let you know when I figure it out. (laughs) Honestly, I think we are all figuring it out. And that is exactly why I wanted to start this podcast, because we are all just on this journey to figuring out how to balance all of our different roles and responsibilities. So just to start off with, I like to go back to the very beginning and ask you, when did you know you wanted to be a physician and why? Yeah, um, it's kind of funny. Uh, I figured this out actually when I recently interviewed my own mom for my podcast. I had her come on to chat about how we never really talked about fertility when I was growing up. And she had diagnoses that I didn't know, like endometriosis until much later in life, that type of thing. And uh, we talked about, you know, what I'm doing now and how I'm a doctor. And um, she reminded me, I remember very distinctly being on an airplane, I was a teenager. I don't know where I was coming home from. And I was sleeping and I heard the announcement like, hey, if there's a doctor on board, please come up. And I got out of my chair and I was like, (laughs) what just happened? Nobody in my family is in medicine. We are all educators and entrepreneurs and nobody has ever been a doctor or nurse, anything like that. I got off the plane and I, my parents were there to meet me at the gate. This was a long time ago, <laughs> different security measures. And I was like, hey, guys, I figured out what I want to do. I want to be a doctor. And they were both like, they didn't tell me this. These are very good parents. But later, my mom tells me on the podcast, she's like, we thought you were joking. There was no way because I wasn't very academically focused. I really? Was really that is yes, surprising. Yes. Um, I was very athletic, uh, field hockey was a big part of my life. Social stuff was a big part of my life. Um, but academics wasn't very just interesting. I got into a great college, honestly, because of being recruited for field hockey and was lucky enough to sort of find my way into medicine along the way. And, um, but I just think it's pretty interesting that it, it, I didn't really focus or figure out what I wanted to do until, cause some people are like, Oh, I just knew it. I, I was born knowing I wanted to be a doctor and it, and it took me a little while. But once I made the decision, I was pretty one direction focused. Wow. So what was it about that flight then? I have no idea. I just, um, it was just something that kind of happened to me. Um, I don't know how much you believe in sort of, you know, things. But I also found out when I graduated from medical school, my grandmother told me that her mom always wanted to be a doctor. And 
I'm actually named after her. Wow. That's, that's my, my name is kind of spelled funny. And um, her parents wouldn't support her going to medical school because people just didn't do that at that time. And so actually, she was a physical ed teacher. She was very athletic. So anyway, I don't know. I'm not saying anything like woo-woo or something like that, but just kind of all of these things came together. And um, my junior year in high school, we were fortunate enough that we have this ability to do internships. Um, and I interned with a pediatric surgeon at Wake Forest Medical School. And um, I just remember I never wanted to leave the OR. Like I didn't want to leave to wow. eat. Like they would check on me. And I was just this like 16, 17 year old kid. And I was like, this is just absolutely fascinating. Um, and, I, you know, you just kind of uh, if you follow that and you find something that you're interested in and believe me with the training and what you have to do to become a doctor, you know, you really need to have a passion for it. And I just am fortunate enough that I found that way. And I feel like your passion for the field really shines through in many different ways. Hmm. And I wonder, once you got into medical school, how did you end up choosing OBGYN? And then how did you end up becoming an infertility doctor? Yeah, I was one of those big nerds that liked everything. I loved surgery. I loved internal medicine. I liked women's health. And I was really thinking... Uh, kind of towards into third year and doing rotations that I was going to do internal medicine, but focus on women's health. I just knew I wanted to take care of women. And I kept doing all these surgi surgical specialties and I just loved the OR. I loved um, the joking, the camaraderie, the music, just that kind of um, camaraderie that happens um, and just that feeling of doing surgery and like accomplishing something and kind of being done and taking care of people. And my very last rotation in third year medical school was OBGYN. And I was like, oh my God, someone made a field for me because it's women's health. It's taking care of people a little bit, you know, ongoing. And then it had a surgical piece to it. Um, right. And so I was just like, this is it. And I had no real exposure to, um, infertility or reproductive endocrinology at Wake Forest. At that time, it wasn't a big part of the program. This is, you know, a really long time ago. Now it is, but back then it wasn't. And um, went to UCSF because my now husband was working in the Bay Area. Um, so did an OBGYN residency there and got exposed to infertility during my, uh, you know, residency. And the more and more that I did obstetrics, um, this was before the 80 hour work week. <laughs> um, so, so you were living just, at the hospital. It, I was living at the hospital. And as you get further and further along, um, you're taking care of more and more complicated patients, especially being at a program like UCSF, which is a referral center for a, a lot of Northern California and surrounding states. And so, um, you know, I think I would have made a great midwife, you know, midwife teach <laughs> Uh, residents, how to deliver at UCSF. They're the ones on labor and delivery oh. and helping with the, you know, the normal and air quotes like vaginal deliveries. And you only bring the OBs in when there's complications. And um, so anyway, I just kind of the further along I got and I was like, gosh, I, I just don't feel like this is right for me. And then mm -hmm. I did a rotation with um, the, you know, Marcel Cedars, who's now uh, still the chair at UC at UCSF and just loved IVF. I loved um, the learning. I loved the technology. I loved um, caring for people at a really vulnerable time. Um, a lot of people are turned away from reproductive endocrinology and infertility because it is a very stressful time for people. There's still a lot of questions that we have. We don't always know why someone isn't getting pregnant. We don't always know why someone's having miscarriages. And you have to be really comfortable with that as a doctor to take care of people when you don't always have the answer, but still want to give them good care. And I was always very comfortable with that and got really, really lucky to get a fellowship. I mean, it is really competitive and I just- Very hard to get so, into. So, 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 so lucky. How many always spots thankful. are there? There was only one. <laughs> Wow. There's less than 40 spots across the country every year, but there's only one at Stanford. I know. I, I didn't just, know there were less than 40 spots. That yeah. is crazy. I totally wow. agree. Wow. I totally agree. There needs to be more. Uh, yes. And they're working on it. And I think it's going to be more 
um, in the future, but it's really, uh, it was kept a very, very small program for a very long time and it is going to be expanding. That's great. Yeah. Wow. I I often say that if I weren't a dermatologist, I would want to be an infertility doctor because I feel like the science is really cool. Uh, the technology, there's such a huge technology piece to it. And it's a field that's constantly advancing. Like, like you mentioned, there is a lot that's unknown, which mm-hmm. I also feel comfortable with that because there's a lot of unknown in dermatology too. Like we don't know why a lot of autoimmune diseases happen or, you know, why people develop certain types of rashes and things like that, or even why we use certain medications even. But aside from that, I think the potential difference you can make in a patient's life is just Mm. amazing and incredible. And I think there's a lot of room for education about uh, infertility on social media as well, which is, I mean, you dominate that space. Mm. So when did you start your social media accounts and oh, yeah. what was the main reason behind starting them? Cause you've sure. been on there for a long time. I like, have kind of like the OGs <laughs> <laughs> and I, you were on before me. I really, really have admired and looked up to you for a very long time, Joyce. Oh, um, thank you. so I, um, I, it's always about education. No question. I realized very early in my career that even though in my field, a new patient visit, I'm still seeing people for an hour, which is such a luxury. Follow-up visits are 30 minutes. Like I really am able to talk to people for a much longer time than a lot of other fields are. Um, but I always was ending with, oh my gosh, I have so much more to tell you. And um, I, I uh, knew that I needed to provide education. So the first way I did it is I wrote books. So I wrote a book on integrative fertility with an acupuncturist. So looking at both Eastern and Western approaches to fertility care and how they can integrate. So if someone's just learning about fertility, I want to understand the difference between an intrauterine insemination or in vitro fertilization or IVF. Um, That's called planting the seeds of pregnancy. And I was like, that is so great. And we self-published through Amazon. It's called Kindle Direct Publishing because I could print it and give it to my patients. So without going through a publisher, I have a lot more control over the information. And my goal was to always to be able to give something. So, you know, back when we used to see patients in person, we would just hand it to them. And now we will, you know, ship our patients books if they want to read it. And then the same thing for miscarriage. So there's so much, so many misconceptions, so much misunderstanding about miscarriage. And so that book is Not Broken, an approachable guide to miscarriage and recurrent pregnancy loss. And it's for, you know, my patients, because I'll spend an hour saying, okay, these are all the tests that we're doing and this is what we're going to do with them, but they can't retain that. You know, yes. and I can so, speak from personal experience. It's very hard uh, to retain any information. It is. And I've been a patient too. And I really appreciate, you know, you're trying to dump, not in a negative way, but you're trying to imbibe all this knowledge and you just can't retain it. And so um, I was able to self-publish that and again, give it to patients as a resource. And so I felt like, gosh, these books, you know, I didn't publish it with a publisher. There's no way to market it. And so to answer your question, I got on Instagram in order to get the word out about my books. And so what I used to do is I would, um, I, another passion of mine is traveling. So I'd always take a copy of my book with me and take pictures like in front of like the Eiffel Tower or Big Ben. And I did this thing for a year where I would just leave books in different places around the world. And I don't know, it was just like a fun little thing. Um, and then it, I really started paying attention to Instagram and how it was an incredible way to educate people and reach people in a different way and connect with colleagues like you yeah. and other fertility doctors. And I know you've talked to other doctors on your podcast about this, but, um, I got a tremendous amount of pushback and real just, harsh words about this in the beginning. Um, But I just persevered because I knew like you get these DMs from people and they're just like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for breaking it down and, you know, teaching me something that I've been trying to understand and kind of in a different way. And so it's really morphed since then, but it's always been based in education. 
And you do such a good job of it. I've Mm -hmm. watched your content across all the different platforms. YouTube, I've listened to your podcast. Obviously, I love your short form content on Instagram. And I feel like you were one of the first doctors to get on TikTok back in 2019 or 2020 when the world was shut down. How did you know to go on this app, which at the time was like a kid's dancing app? Like, How did you decide to do that? Well, I've always been open to everything. So if something's coming along, I'm like, sure, I'll get on Clubhouse. Sure, I'll get on, you know, Matador. I'll try all these things. And, you know, I have older kids. They're now, you know, in middle school and high school. And I remember very distinctly, um, I was at um, our ASRM medical conference. Um, It was October 2019. Um, I was in my friend Natalie Crawford's uh, hotel room. We're getting ready to do an Instagram live. I was like, Nat, have you heard of TikTok? And she's kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, and I'm like, I think I'm going to make a TikTok. Took me two hours (laughs) to make my first TikTok (laughs) because there were no like, you know, how to videos or anything. And I remember at the Instagram live, I was like, hey, I'm on TikTok and I just made my first video, like, go check it out. And um Oh, yeah, definitely a lot of heat for doing that. But I, t- you know, prove me wrong, but I actually do think I'm the first uh, fertility doctor on TikTok. And I just had fun. And especially in the pandemic, oh my gosh, Joyce, being in medicine during that time, I mean, we all still have PTSD from that. But it was a way to connect with other people. Um, I mean, doing dances. I remember I did the renegade when I got to like a hundred thousand followers. Cause I just like did this bet like with my kids and it was <laughs> so painful to watch, but I don't dance anymore, but you know, I'm sure I've had a lot of fun. I used to dance too. And that's when I got <laughs> on it was mainly just to, to entertain myself, honestly, yes. because yes. I was at home on maternity leave when TikTok got big. This was 2020, Mm -hmm. like January or February, 2020, I just had my baby and I was at home and I was like, I need some type of creative outlet. That's also fun for me. Mm -hmm. And so I've always liked dancing. I'm not good at it, but I love it. (laughs) And so I was like consuming all this content, watching all this fun choreography that was being done by like literal teenagers. And so I would do the dances. Like I remember doing the renegade dance and all the other (laughs) popular viral dance challenges and then just putting skincare advice on top of it. And the potential to go viral on TikTok was just eye-opening. I mean, I soon surpassed my Instagram following, which I had been working on Instagram for like seven or eight years. But with TikTok, it was just like that. Yeah. And that really showed me the potential of just how many people we could reach and how much education you could put out and really reach people where they wanted to be reached. Absolutely. So it was very eye opening for me. Yeah. And I love like learning from you too. There's so many times where I just am like, oh, there's Joyce. What is she teaching me today? And you do it in a really fun and engaging way. Um, I don't know. It's amazing. It's hard to keep people's attention these days. It is. Um, but skincare is something that everybody needs to learn about. It's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you for that. I I am glad that there's so much interest in skincare. I feel like there's never ending topics that I could cover. It is difficult to try to keep people's attention or to capture viewers attention in a very quick way, because I feel like social media has changed a lot and how we consume content has changed a lot. And so I'm constantly trying to figure out where I fit into that space and how I can give information in this digestible way that is still kind of fun. And you and I were talking earlier about how we're kind of at a crossroads about where we're figuring out what we want to do and where we want to focus our time in social media. Mm -hmm. So for you, because you're on so many different platforms, what types of content do you enjoy? Is it long form? Is it short form? Is it podcasting? Where do you want to focus your time? Because you're obviously busy. You have a thriving practice. You have two kids. You're busy and you travel a ton. (laughs) So where do you see yourself going with social media? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head is that it's constantly changing. And the only way that anybody would kind of stick around is if they're curious and interested in experimenting and kind of trying new things. Um, 
And so it's definitely changed over time. Like I used to be very focused on Instagram. Then I really focused on TikTok. Um, and right now I am really enjoying YouTube and my podcast. The podcast is an incredible way to connect with people. Like you and I were talking, <laughs> like we need to get together socially, like outside of recording a podcast, but like, this is the way sometimes I'm connecting with people I haven't connected with a long time. Like, Hey, come on the podcast. Let's catch up. Um, and it's a way to get into, um, a deeper discussion about things that really are very important beyond just a 60 second clip. Like there's, it's fun to do those and it's, it is, um, interesting. Um, and I'm curious about hooks and like how to like look at watch time and stuff. But if I really want to dig into a topic and learn myself, it's got to be in a longer form. And, um, you know, reconciling a lot, especially in this political climate and threats to IVF. And, you know, I, you know, was a biology major in college, but a theology minor, because I was so fascinated with the integration with religion and science and how you reconcile those things. Like, I can't get into that in a 60 second TikTok, but I can really delve in on the podcast. And then YouTube, one thing that I would just say is like, I really wish I'd got on it sooner. I was so intimidated to start on YouTube because I had been on Instagram for so long. I was one of the first doctors on TikTok. Like, I'm like, okay, I got this. And it got really comfortable and kind of easy. And YouTube, I just feel like is this totally different uh, beast, you know, with longer for form content. And like, it's a different... Um, person that is listening or learning. Um, but what I've really understood now is that if you're really trying to educate people, people are going to YouTube to learn. You know, I feel like they're often going to Instagram to be a little bit entertained or same thing with right. TikTok. But if you truly want to learn about a topic and if this is all about education, you're going to go to YouTube. Like you need to clear out a drain in your, you know, house. Like you're going to go to YouTube to look, look that up. You know, you're going to have a history of salpingogram, which is a fertility test to make sure the fallopian tubes are open. You're probably going to go to YouTube to learn more about it. Um, so I would say more not leaving alone any, you know, any things that I'm doing right now, but uh, just really focusing on YouTube and the podcast because it's bringing me a lot of joy. I think that's the important thing is focusing on what brings you joy because oftentimes I feel like I have to do all these things because there are so many opportunities. And if I don't capture one of them, maybe I'll be left behind. Like I also wish I got on YouTube earlier. I only started on YouTube in 2022. So mm -hmm. kind of late, like way mm -hmm. later than all my other platforms. I had attempted a few YouTube videos when I was in residency, but back then I had no idea what I was doing. I was like <laughs> trying to edit the videos myself, which was mm -hmm. a mistake because I don't have time to edit long form videos. And I started in 2022, kind of with some urging from some of my colleagues who have YouTube channels. And it is so much work. Like it is more yeah, work than creating short form content by far, because I have to spend a lot of time researching topics. I read a lot of peer reviewed literature to mm -hmm. make sure I can back up everything I say and list all the references and prepare all the products I'm going to talk about. And it's just a lot more preparation than making short form content. But like you mentioned, I feel like I can get much deeper into mm -hmm. topics than I can on short form videos. And so it's, it's a labor of love. I will say yes. YouTube is a labor of love and it is slower growing. So sometimes yeah. you don't get that dopamine hit that you get yep. when a video goes viral on short form platforms, but it's kind of like a slow and steady burn. So I think I also want to continue to spend time on YouTube. I'm still figuring out my groove with the podcast because it also is very time consuming. And I think I mentioned to you earlier, I think I'm just, instead of holding myself to this standard of, I have to publish short form content six days a week, which really is becoming unsustainable. Absolutely. I think I can just do three times a week. I think Absolutely. that is actually fine. I don't think it'll make a difference. So yeah. I think it's letting go of some of these artificial kind of 
schedule guidelines that I set for myself and just yeah. giving myself some grace and focusing on things that bring me joy. Exactly yeah. like you said. Yeah. And giving yourself a little bit of a break from that sort of um, goal of five or six times a week. Um, you might even find that after a little bit of a break, you find yourself more creative. Like whenever you feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I haven't done my, you know, sixth post this week and you're just doing it to do that post, um, that I, I feel like that's when the burnout comes, you know? Right. Right. And because when inspiration strikes and it's a lot easier to film and you're like, oh, I'm having fun again. Yes. Yeah. And I just think um, what I have sort of felt is there's such a longevity to content on YouTube and yeah. podcasts, whereas on TikTok and Instagram, even when you post something that's wonderful, it doesn't get to all of your followers. It has a very short half life. Um and there are videos that I put on YouTube, you know, two years ago that are now just starting to kind of pop off. And so it, you do have to be more patient, but I think it's worth it in the long run if you enjoy it. <laughs> right, right. It all goes back to that, that we should do things that bring us joy. And one of the YouTube videos of yours that I watched was when I was starting my intramuscular progesterone shots. And I was having a lot of trouble with the progesterone in oil. Yep. Um, I think it was the sesame oil. I was having like weird allergic reactions to yeah. it, but I watched your video initially to figure out how to even do this shot because it's crazy that we are doing this at home. Totally. I mean, I'm a doctor, so I'm like, okay, I'm at least a little more familiar with, you know, drawing up the medication and mm -hmm. syringes and all of that. But my husband was the one administering the shots and he's an engineer. Yeah. So I mean, more power to him. He did a really good job with the shots, but <laughs> I remember watching your YouTube video about mm. that. And so yeah. your content is, you know, it's very, very helpful. And, and mm. YouTube is very searchable too. So yep. it's like, um, people go there to search for things that they want to learn about exactly yeah. like you mentioned. So, yeah. um, there are so many things I want to talk to you about. Sure. I feel like you, you mentioned several things in the past few minutes that I want to dive a little bit deeper into. Uh, one of them is, so you had a theology minor mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask if you are religious, mm -hmm. if you were brought up religious, if you are currently practicing any religion and how does that tie into your practice as a doctor? Yeah. Awesome. I have a strong faith, but I don't practice a cer certain religion. Um, my dad was a Southern Baptist. And I don't know if you know, but like a month ago, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, passed a resolution that conceiving with IVF is immoral. <laughs> oh yeah, goodness. I'm from the South. He almost became wow. a Southern Baptist minister. He actually wow. ended up leaving the church because it uh, wasn't a great fit later. And then my mom was another Protestant religion called Moravian, which is this small Protestant, really wonderful uh, group that's actually dedicated to the education of women. Um, they're from Moravia, which is now, you know, the Czech Republic. And they started the first institution for education for women in the United States. And I graduated from that high school. It's called Salem Academy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like really interesting. And um, so went to church growing up, but, um, you know, wasn't like a huge part of our family. And then um, when I went to Georgetown, uh, I was one of five people from North Carolina and let me just tell you how little I know about the Catholic religion. Uh, the very first, uh, I'll say it's a day in the spring, we were walking around campus and all my friends had like dirt on their foreheads. I was like, guys, what is this? You're like, oh my God, <laughs> Laura, it's Ash Wednesday. Like we went to mass this morning and I was like, what is Ash Wednesday? So I just am like, curious and open, but you know, I, I just think it's really funny that I went to a Catholic institution. and didn't even know what Ash Wednesday was, <laughs> but, um, that, uh, school is founded by the Jesuits and Jesuits are one of the most curious and highly educated group of people in the world. Like the amount of study and actual focus on learning that they have to do in order to become a Jesuit is incredible. And I just kept taking all these classes with Jesuits because um, 
they're just curious. They're curious people. And that's the thing is we're constantly learning. Um, and, you know, they, they're the ones that we sometimes have class like and yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I probably shouldn't say this on the podcast. We sometimes have class at the bar, the tombs, which is like in Georgetown. And, <laughs> you know, we were all of age, but like just kind of like sitting around and really talking about things. And um, I mean, some of the strongest arguments I've heard for really controversial things, you know, like for abortion, for a lot of things have come from Jesuits because they're able to look at the big picture. And um, I think that right now there is a really huge tension, obviously. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to use my words carefully um, because, you, you know, I can actually see both sides. I can see people being very strongly for protecting, you know, children, but really getting in the way of medical care because truly just not understanding that sometimes terminating a pregnancy really needs to happen for a lot of reasons. And when you're trying to make this decision outside of a medical situation, you know, making it with laws and politicians, that you just lose the nuance. Um, and so it's amazing that this curiosity, this learning has kind of come full circle. And now, you know, I really am trying to educate and teach truly to try to just protect access to family building. You know, it's amazing since the overturn of uh, Roe v. Wade, which I was, you know, just still shocked. Um, it, it, it truly, truly people are coming after IVF as the next thing. Um, and we can all mm -hmm. sort of assume like, oh my gosh, of course that's not going to happen, but it really is. And it's uh, uh, kind of shocking and um, I'm not really giving you like a really straight answer, but uh, I do have a strong faith. I think we're going to figure it out together. But in the meantime, you know, a lot of people are suffering with this, with laws that are meant to protect people or save, you know, pregnancies. There are women who are not able to even, you know, get treatment for a miscarriage that is highly desired. They want to have a family and then they're not getting treatment and they're honestly suffering medical consequences. So I'm not sure how deep you want to get into that, Joyce, but definitely something that I think about very deeply and it's top of mind, of course. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. I know it's a difficult topic to talk about in today's environment. And I was thinking about it also in the context of IVF, because recently I've been sharing more about my own journey with infertility and going through IVF. And someone reached out to me through DMs and said that they were struggling with deciding to go through with IVF because of their faith, because yeah. they felt like they didn't want to go through IVF and play the role of God, basically. Oh, yes. And so I just felt like, for me, I am a Christian and I also have a very strong faith. And I think even going through IVF, there is so much unknown and there's so much that's out of your hands. I didn't realize mm -hmm. this before going into it. I honestly had thought before going through IVF that you just go through the steps and then you get a baby. And that is just not the case at all. I've had so many ups and downs where I did go through all the steps. My first cycle, I didn't get any embryos. My second cycle, you know, we got embryos, but then the transfer didn't work. And so what I wrote back to this person was that even if you go through this, these, these techno using these technologies and go through the procedures, I still think it's up to God whether or not it succeeds because so much of it requires a leap of faith. And I remember having to lean very heavily on my faith through my own IVF journey mm -hmm. because as someone who always expected positive outcomes if I put in the work, this was just something that I completely had no control over. And that was very hard for me to accept. Mm -hmm. But it was also a very humbling experience. And I think mm -hmm. it really made me realize that some things I just need to let out of my hands and put it in God's hands. Yeah. And I wondered, you know, you being on the other side of this as you being the physician, how do you help patients with their expectations? Mm -hmm. How do you help them manage their expectations? And how do you help them through sometimes what might be disappointing outcomes? 
Oh my gosh, absolutely. There's so many things that you brought up that I want to talk about in what you just said. First of all, I very much appreciate your sharing your story because it helps people feel less alone. Um, I appreciate your sharing your faith. I feel like in this, you know, environment, like it's just, you know, anything that you share, people are going to have judgments about, but I love that you have a faith. I love it when my patients talk to me about it. One of the things that I really learned in my studies and theology understanding, and then what I've learned in just life is the closer we get to understanding something, the more we realize that we don't know. And I see it every single day in my practice, you know, a gorgeous, you know, embryo doesn't implant or an embryo that is fragmented and doesn't really look that great, but it's the only one that we have, you know, turns into a beautiful baby, an embryo that's been chromosomally tested, which is the, is the most common cause of miscarriage. That patient gets pregnant, but still has a miscarriage. Like the we still have so much to learn and you have to be comfortable. It's what we talked about at the beginning of the, you know, the, the interview, how I'm comfortable sitting in the unknown and giving people compassionate care, even if I can't always promise a baby or with every single transfer, there's never going to be a hundred percent success. And I do talk to people about their faith. And I talk about like, if they're thinking about doing IVF, we talk about, Hey, there might be more embryos available than you feel comfortable transferring. We can freeze them. And that really does. It's a wonderful thing because if you aren't successful with your first transfer, we don't have to go through the egg retrieval again. You can just transfer another embryo. But how do you feel about having frozen embryos? How do you feel about maybe having more embryos? And if someone says, hey, I really feel uncomfortable with that. Like that's one of the reasons I'm really reluctant to do IVF, even though my fallopian tubes are blocked or we have very little sperm, like they need IVF to conceive. I'll say, great, we don't have to fertilize all the eggs. We mm -hmm. could just fertilize a certain number of eggs to create embryos. And the rest of those eggs, we can freeze as eggs because most people feel more comfortable discarding eggs than embryos. And that's why when people are coming after IVF or trying to take that option away as a moral injustice or the way the field is treating embryos, I feel like the fertility community cares more about embryos than anyone. And you don't have to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You don't have to completely remove access to IVF uh, in order to still be respectful. And so I will bring that up and I will talk to people about, hey, ethically, what do you feel comfortable with? And and we kind of go there. And, and I I have many patients that I think that uh, my patients who are Catholic have the strongest um, uh, unease with going forward with IVF because the Catholic Church really does condemn it since the 1970s. Like literally, I think it was right around the time Louise Brown, the first IVF baby, was born in 1978, the Catholic Church. Um, instituted a decree that felt like IVF was not the right way to have a baby and they really still stand by it. But I will tell you, I've had people who have talked to their priests and been really open about this is the only way that I can have a family. I've tried to adopt. I've tried to do all these other things. And it becomes a really personal choice. And there are people that still decide to do it. And I hate that people have guilt about trying to have a family, you know, isn't that kind of one of the pillars of, you know, community and a lot of religions. And it just, I, this tension is just, um, I don't think it's necessary. I really don't. It really is very complicated yeah. and very complex. And I like what you said about how you don't necessarily have to fertilize all the eggs. And so it could be a fertility preservation technique that you have the eggs available for a future date if you do decide that you want more children. So I, I hadn't really thought about it in that way, but that's so amazing. And I think it's really wonderful that free egg freezing is also becoming more widespread, yeah. that there's more people who know about it because I feel like for women in medicine or any other really demanding um, field or or profession, oftentimes we're so busy 
trying to get ahead in school, internships, job, whatnot, so that a lot of times our most fertile years are spent hustling at work. No question. And we may not have time to find the right partner or have time to get pregnant and have kids. And yeah. the timing is just tough. And so having this technology available that you could have it as a backup option is, mm-hmm. is great. And I don't understand why we have to take it away. I know. Yeah. I, um, I mean, egg freezing, I'm just writing about it in my newsletter this week. Like there's an excellent article in the New York times, like, is it a, you know, you know, feminist dream or a Silicon sort of Valley uh, fantasy, right? Like it's amazing. And believe me, if egg freezing were available when I was in medical school, I would have absolutely done it because I too struggled to have my kids because I absolutely put my family building on hold until I felt like it was right and kind of after my training. And, you know, that's why there's many reasons, but I think that's why more physicians are infertile than the general population, you know, general population one in six physicians, one in four. And, um, but I also feel like it's kind of a patch. (laughs) It's not the solution. Um, the solution is finding a way for people to have babies when they're their most fertile. And this is a pretty controversial thing. Like most people are like, Oh no, egg freezing is amazing. And here I do egg freezing every day. Yes. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's great. But Uh, I really think deeply about how (sighs) there's a whole generation of women that, first of all, were not educated that fertility changes with age. They were really encouraged to have it all in air quotes. Um, But that means, you know, focusing on your career and then hoping your fertility is still okay. And by the way, when you're ready to have a baby, there's no maternity leave, there's no child care, there's no support. So it's just this you know, we're having a little bit of a moment, I think, and trying to figure out like, what does it mean to have it all and sort of at what cost, you know? Absolutely. I, I used to think having it all was the goal. Mm -hmm. And then I quickly realized that that just sets you up for disappointment. It sets you up for failure, really, because no one can have it all at the same time. There is no way that you could work in clinic all day And be a stay at home mom and do all the stay at home mom things and be home (laughs) for your children all day. Like you can't be in two places at once. And that actually brings me to the next topic, which I wanted to ask you about, which is how do you find balance between Mm -hmm. your demanding job? I know that being an infertility doctor, you're on call as well. And sometimes you work weekends, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that with being a wife, being a mom, finding time for travel Mm -hmm. and finding time to fill your own cup. Like what does your village look like? What kind of help do you have? How do you make it work? Yeah. Well, the word balance is a misnomer because like you said, it's never all completely balanced and you do have to make choices at certain times. You really need to focus on, you know, career or you're on call. You really, you got to work, you got to come in. And then, um, there are times where your family just absolutely needs you. And there is no like secret except trying to get as much help as I possibly can, being humble about what I can and can't do. And at the end of the day, what is my priority? My priority is my family. So I love my job. I love the women that I work with. We have the most incredible practice um, here in Seattle. Um, Um, I love the social media. I love the podcast, you know, that creating content brings me joy. But at the end of the day, uh, if somebody in my family needs me, like that's where I'm going to be. That that comes first. Um, I think um, having a lot of help, like I don't have family in the Seattle area. Um, and so we've always had a nanny or a household helper because my husband has a very demanding job at, at Microsoft and I have a very demanding job as a doctor. Um, I've always worked four days a week. Um, mm-hmm. I've always had a day out of the office um, to do a lot of things you just kind of get need to get done during the week, you know, doctor's appointments and, you know, exercise and things like that. And then it allows me when I'm not working on the weekend to focus on family time. Um, So that's been a big um, help. Uh, 
and and then just really working with an incredible group of women that have the same values that I do. Like, yes, we want to work. We want to provide this incredible care, but we all want a day during the week where we do stuff. We all agree that family time is extremely important. I mean, there are doctors that work until 10 o'clock at night in the fertility realm, and that is just never been us. It's never been our drive. And we always are so supportive of each other. If somebody, you know, you know, we, we give maternity leave, like, is that required in the United States? No, as a, you know, business owner, we don't have to do that, but right. yes, we do. Because <laughs> when I delivered, I got six weeks and I was still working from home. Like, and that is not okay. It's not like, oh, I had it so hard. No, my junior partner's they should get, you know, four months, like, or more, I don't care. Um, so I think it's finding the right people, always figuring out what your priorities are, and really um, sticking with it, you know, just, it's always family that comes first, if, that, if that's helpful. I love that. And I feel like that was so good for me to hear too, because I'm, <laughs> in the midst of trying to figure out everything, social media, my practice and my babies. Cause my, I have a five month old and a four and a half year old. And I feel like they both really need me right now. I mean, they'll always need me. Right. Yeah. But I feel like also I want to enjoy the time I have with, with my baby because I know how quickly it goes. I know it's like Mm. the blink of an eye. And I started working again really soon after she was born. Uh, I started traveling again and it's actually insane. I've been to so many different places since she's been born because there have been a lot of cool opportunities. And I think it's just trying to find a way to still be able to experience some of these neat opportunities that enrich my life, but Mm -hmm. also be very present for her at the times when I'm home. And we haven't had a nanny for the past two months, which has been really difficult. And I think that not having a nanny is difficult for everyone because it's less time for the older kid, less time for my husband to focus on his pursuits, puts a strain on my work, like my Mm -hmm. ability to do my work. And it also creates more pressure in the marriage, I think, because we're having to take care of the baby in between meetings and juggle all of this. So I feel like we really, we are getting a nanny though. And so that this is like, hopefully a turning point for us that things are going to get a little bit easier and we'll have time to actually exercise and Mm. see friends and, you know, just get a little bit more get a little bit more balance in, in yeah. my life. So I'm I looking forward to that. That's wonderful. And I think um, accepting help is one of the hardest things for, I think, especially women in medicine, it's conditioned in us to always sacrifice our goals, our health, our desires, everything in order to help other people, you know, whether it's the family, whether it's your patients and to accept help is actually really hard and it's a skill and you, need to do it. And getting a nanny or having help cleaning your home or, you know, getting a meal service or whatever it is, that's not a sign of weakness. It opens up time for you to have one-on-one time with your son. If you have a nanny, then the nanny can focus on your daughter And you can take your son to the zoo because that one-on-one time is so important. It doesn't mean you're lazy or you don't want to raise your children. Um, I just really think that's important. And something that I think is really important for people to realize is I think a lot of times when people talk about um, being a parent or um, raising children, we really focus on those young years that are so physically intense right? Uh, And I had friends that told me this, but I'm only just starting to figure it out now. There's this intermediate phase where the kids are in school and they're just kind of on autopilot and everything's kind of great. And then wham, like middle school and high school, they absolutely need you again. I've heard this as well. Yeah. And it's much more emotionally um, trying, not physically trying because they can feed themselves, they can babysit themselves, they can you know, get themselves to bed. But the emotional piece or 
just the presence of being a parent and being around for when they want to share something is, is just really important. And so it's just, uh, another thing is like, there's phases and that partnership that you talked about, you know, with my husband and I both having very demanding jobs, there are times where we have conversations and we're like, okay, like right now we need to focus on, on you. I'm going to step back and we've kind of, you know, switched on and off too. Uh, so having open conversations about that's really important. And if you're finding like you're both not having time to kind of do those things, then have an open conversation about asking for help. Sometimes I'm not saying this is you, but sometimes people have very sort of traditional minded, um, you know, relationships where it's like, well, if anyone's going to sacrifice, it's got to be the mom, you know, so that person has to pull back on the things that bring them joy and not allowing for asking for help. And I just think asking for help is really okay. Asking for help is so necessary. (laughs) And uh, we're very lucky because my husband has reached a point in his career where he can take a step back. So he's doing more of all the house stuff. Um, and his parents are actually moving here, which is a huge bonus for us. And we're so awesome. excited for them to be close by to spend time with our kids and also have that backup care. Absolutely. So we're really excited for that. And I think, you know, I think that the past couple of months have been hard without a nanny, but things are going to get better from here on out, you know, and hopefully she starts sleeping a little better at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so hard. Yeah. I just, I feel for you. You're going through, it's just, there, that's a really tough time. With it's a two physically littles. very tiring time, It really, but is. also very fun. They're very cute. Good thing they're cute. Yeah. But give yourself grace to uh, Joyce and, you know, like, like you said, you're trying to figure out the podcast or figure out YouTube or something like it's also okay to pause on something if you need to until you figure out this other little piece of life. It doesn't mean that you're giving up on one thing. It can just be like, okay, right now, I need to focus because remember, the biggest misnomer is having it all or having balance. It's okay, where am I going to focus my energy right now? Yep. No, I love that. That's such an important reminder. This has been such an amazing conversation. I'm so glad we got to get together virtually and talk about things and we will get together in real life very soon. Yes. But thank you so much for all your transparency and your honesty and sharing about all of these different things. Mm -hmm. I know that our, both of our communities can learn so much from this conversation. And to round it out, do you want to share where my listeners can find you on social media? Oh, thank you. Well, podcast listeners, uh, Baby or Bust Fertility Podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts, it's, you know, interviews, it's focused on fertility and reproductive health, but it's also just learning a lot about a lot of what's going on right now. Um, and then, of course, um, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, uh, it's all Dr. Laura Shaheen. That's my handle everywhere. So I would love to connect. Awesome. Makes it easy. One handle. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And we will be seeing each other very soon. Thank you, Joyce. It's a true honor. Thank you for joining us today for our Real Unfiltered Conversations. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit subscribe on your favorite audio podcast platform. And if you're more visually inclined, all of our video podcast episodes are available on my YouTube channel at Tea with MD. For more beauty and skincare content, don't forget to check out my Instagram and TikTok at Tea with MD. Remember, life isn't just about the curated content we see on social media. It's about these real conversations we have with each other. So continue spilling the tea with your friends, family, and loved ones. And together we can create a more open, connected, and authentic community. Until next time.